right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Monday, everybody. Hope all of you guys are having a great start to your week. Well, that game last night I thought was the biggest NBA game since Game 4 of the 2022 NBA Finals between the Boston Celtics and the Golden State Warriors. When you really factor in the stakes and how it felt like the the eventual champion was kind of tilting on that game potentially in a big way, I think Boston is on a similar level to those two teams. But it just felt like a monumentally important moment in NBA history. So as a basketball fan, I want to kind of dive a little bit deeper into it than I was able to last night. So what we're going to do today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I noticed rewatching the game. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the fallout for both teams, talk a little bit about Jokic in the big picture after what happened last night. And then I have 39 clips to go over all the stuff that I found in my film session. Obviously, it's a little bit of overkill considering the series is over, but as a basketball fan, I can't help myself. So we're going to dive a lot deeper into that Denver-Minnesota series, kind of like an autopsy of everything that took place over the last couple of weeks. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to our brand new YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore JasonLT so you guys don't miss show announcements. Don't forget about our podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts under Hoops Tonight. And then keep dropping mailbag questions in the YouTube comments so we can keep hitting them throughout the rest of the postseason. And the last but not least, before we get started, I want to talk to you guys about game time. We have two rounds left of the NBA playoffs. you got to get out and see these guys in person. Incredible star power between Anthony Edwards, Luka Doncic, Kyrie Irving, and going out east to guys like Jason Tatum and Tyrese Halliburton. Tons of star power. you got to get out and see these guys in person. Game time has an amazing ticket-buying experience. I used them earlier this year to go see a game at McHale Center for the Arizona men's basketball team. Got a great deal on a last-minute ticket. Got a great seat. I want you guys to check it out. They have all-in pricing, so you don't have to get surprised by anything when you go to check out. You're going to know exactly what you're paying before you go through that process. It's not convoluted. It's easy. You can check it out in as few as two taps, and you can get a good picture of your seat when you're in the checkout process so you know exactly what you're going to be going to see when you get to the arena. They also have flash deals and zone deals. I like the zone deals. This is this concept where you pick a zone and then game time picks the seats for you within the zone and you get additional savings that way. Take the guesswork out of buying professional basketball tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account and use code hoops for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code hoops. That's H O O P S for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price Guaranteed. All right, let's talk some basketball. So, uh, the story of the game. You know, if you guys remember, I was talking with the uh, with the nerds when we did our uh, breakdown after Game Six. The I talked about how specifically in Game Seven, Minnesota needed to try to take a sledgehammer to Denver's foundation. Now, that's a, a, a kind of like a metaphor, right? But the reason why I kind of like I saw it that way is if you look at this series. When Denver was very methodical and played Denver Nugget basketball, like we know this team is capable of, they were able to find the cracks in Minnesota's defense and score effectively. And we saw that for extensive stretches, right? Not just in those three games, game three, four, and five, when Minis uh, when Denver dominated Minnesota, but also in game seven, even. In the process of them going up 58 to 38, they had excellent offensive execution. They did what they did, more or less, in the middle third of the series, right? But in that third quarter stretch, Minnesota was able to crack Denver's foundation. And the way that that kind of manifested was a lot of mistakes, a lot of stuff that doesn't look like Denver Nugget basketball, right? Like Jamal Murray got ripped at half court twice, right? Like Jokic fell apart defensively. And on the glass, he gave up a, a he was really bad defensive rebounding down the stretch of this game. They were missing box outs as a team like crazy. Michael Porter Jr. got bullied by Nas Reed out of the right corner once on, on a crash. Their defensive rotations weren't as sharp. Their rim protection was really poor. A lot of stuff that we saw Denver do well early in the series or in the middle of the series, I should say was the exact opposite of what we saw from Denver. And that's the thing. Like that's I've said this before, but like the cre the biggest credit you can pay a defense is when a defense actually manages to shake the identity of who they're playing. Meaning like they start to make uncharacteristic mistakes and behaviors. That to me is the 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 hallmark of it. A, a defense that causes you to lose your composure is another level of defense than uh than what we typically see around the NBA, right? And that was the story of the series, in my opinion. When Denver stayed sharp, they could weather the storm. 
but multiple occasions in the series, Minnesota was able to shake their foundation. They made their decision-making crater. They made them miss shots. They made them turn the basketball over. They made them make defensive mistakes. They couldn't rebound. They didn't look like the Nuggets. And so that is the biggest credit that I could pay to Minnesota. On the Minnesota front, I thought Ant was mostly awesome in the second half of this game. Going back to look at the film, his double teams generated countless advantage situations. As a matter of fact, and Ant said this after the game, he was like, they kept trapping me even though I wasn't playing well. And if there's a bit of criticism to throw at Mike Malone there, it's Ant was having a bad night. And so throwing all the, now the double teams played a role in that, but it might've been worthwhile if you looked at the fact that Minnesota got their offense going in the second half in large part off of those double teams, it might've been worth trying something differently, something different to see if Ant's kind of like cold spell would have continued. That said, I'm not sure if it would have made much of a difference. If you don't double Ant, maybe Ant gets going in a different way down the stretch of that game. But I thought his double, the double teams and him getting rid of the basketball in a timely fashion generated a lot of open looks. You guys are going to see in the film, everything I'm talking about, all the stuff I just said about Denver's mistakes, all the stuff I just said about uh, the shot creation from Ant. I have 39 clips we're going to go through. I, I want to kind of demonstrate it all as much as I can through film. But in addition to that, Ant started to find ways to generate rim pressure, splitting pick and roll. So like when Jokic would come up high, he'd split that gap between the two guys, the, between the screener and Jokic and get downhill, just finding ways to generate rim pressure by any means necessary. He's had some kickouts for, for three-point shooters that were impressive. Guys were crashing behind his rim pressure to get offensive rebounds. And then honestly, like, you know, I was really curious to go back and look at the film about this specifically, because after the game, Ant was talking a lot of trash about what he did to Jamal Murray. He specifically said on his way back to the locker room, I put him in handcuffs. And I went back to look at the film, and he did. It won't show up in the box score because Jamal had you know, 34, 35 points or whatever. But from the moment that Denver was up 20 to the moment that the Minnesota was up by five, so in that 25-point swing, Jamal Murray did not score a single point. It was a lot of of really good ball pressure, top locking, denying, a lot of funneling. That's the main thing you guys are going to see on film. And staying attached to Jamal over screens, which forced Jamal to drive into help and not be able to find any openings. It also allowed Carl Anthony Towns to kind of stay home on Jokic on the roll. It was unbelievable defensively in the second half of this game, and he really did put Jamal in handcuffs. I see now, having gone back to look at the film more closely, why he felt like, hey, I had a shitty offensive night for the most part, but I, I can impact the game in other ways, and I did that by removing Jamal from the game during the run, and that's absolutely what he did. It, honestly, like you could actually see Jamal go pretty passive for stretches because he wasn't shaking free from Ant. There was a lot of two-man game with Michael Porter Jr. and KCP and Aaron Gordon as they went to look other directions instead of going through Jamal because Jamal just wasn't getting anything. He had a couple of field goals, a floater and a pull-up jumper in the late portion of the game after Minnesota had already taken control, but it was too late at that point. Uh, it, honestly, like for especially for a 22 year old, it was just an incredibly impressive turnaround to be having a disastrous game. What was he one for nine at one point? And that ninth shot was an air ball that missed to the left of the rim by like a foot. He was having an absolute disaster of a game, and through sheer force of defensive willpower and rim pressure and absorbing those double teams and making plays, he just found a way to impact winning in the second half of that game. Honestly, like it was an incredibly impressive moment for a young player. And honestly, if you zoom out from the series, he averaged what 29, 6 and 6 on 62% true shooting with the, uh, like he was he was incredible. Over 2 steals and blocks per game combined, like he he was a, a major factor in the series. He had some bad defensive moments early in the series with Jamal Murray, but down the stretch of the series, game 6 and game 7, he did his job and, and played him uh, into some disastrous stretches. I thought I thought Ant was incredible. He deserves a ton of credit for for what he did for his team last night. Carl Anthony Towns, going back to look at the film, was amazing. His defense on Jokic was a revelation. Jokic tried to shoot over him in the post three times in the second half run, and all three of them were tough fadeaway jumpers over his right shoulder. He flattened out his post-ups, avoided the bully ball, and made him make over-the-top shots, and Jokic just did not have as good of a season 
as a jump shooter, which we're going to get to in more detail here in a minute. But also, Cat just did an amazing job generating rim pressure. He had he drove right by Jokic to score twice in the second half, just like straight up man to man, one on one against Jokic. Went right around him once he drew a foul. Once he got a driving layup, he drove right by, by Christian Brown for a layup. He spun off of KCP and drew a uh, drew a foul on the baseline. He was a big like secondary offensive creation force over the course of this game. It, it, and again, like w- a lot of times, like we're going to talk about this more with Ant in a minute, but like heavy is the head that wears the crown, like the superstar, the guy at the top of the, the, the head of the snake gets all of the aggressive defensive coverages. Ant was seeing the double teams. Ant was seeing the, the, the traps and the high drops and all that stuff. Cat had favorable matchups. And so it was imperative for him to take advantage of that. And he did. And so again, like, Carl Anthony Towns' biggest, you know, the biggest rub on him is his inconsistency, but like he has shown up in a lot of big ways in this playoff run. And we have to tip the cat. This is a guy that I've been very critical of. This is a guy that seemingly the entire NBA fan base has been very critical of over the years, but he just made a lot of big plays in a really big game last night. So tip of the cap to Carl Anthony Towns. Nas Reed. He got two buckets off of advantage situations. There was a transition cross match where they pushed the ball up the floor. Jamal Murray ended up on Nas Reed, and he quickly hit a little lefty hook on him. And then he drove uh, he drove uh, a Jamal Murray closeout off of one of those ant double teams at the top of the key and got a layup on the right side of the basket. But honestly, I thought him attacking the offensive glass was his biggest impact, especially down the stretch of the game. He just kept coming flying in off the wings when the shot went up. He had uh, the tip dunk, and he also drew a foul on a play where Ant missed a layup, but Michael Porter Jr. was guarding Nas Reed in the right corner, and Nas Reed came in and just bullied uh, 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 MPJ, just shoved him off and got the offensive rebound and went back up and drew a foul on KCP. Like He was just a monster athletically, a huge part of that wave-after-wave type of approach that Minnesota brings to the table. And then Jaden McDaniels, obviously he was awesome defensively, forced Aaron Gordon into a big turnover uh, during the run, hit a few huge corner threes on kickouts from Anthony Edwards, and then had a big driving floater on Jamal Murray in that fourth quarter run. The Wolves played a nearly perfect half of basketball. And when you kind of zoom out on this series, they were the better team because they were able to conquer their weaknesses and reach their ceiling more frequently than Denver did. They this is a team that I think has some pl- pretty glaring weaknesses and they all just came to fruition. Like like uh uh Jaden McDaniels is a really inconsistent offensive player. He was massive in this game. Carl Anthony Towns kind of an inconsistent secondary star. He was massive in this game. Rudy Gobert, hell, the first half <laughs> he was so bad in that first half, and he was amazing in the fourth quarter of this game. Anthony Edwards confronted a lot of his demons in that game and overcame them down the stretch. Like every Timberwolf looked themselves in the mirror, looked at their flaws, and said, "Screw that, we're winning tonight." And, and they did it. So tip of the cap to the to the Minnesota Timberwolves. Anthony Edwards. I talked about this earlier, but there's a reality to what the superstar burden is. Like, you are the head of the snake. You are the head of the game plan. Michael Malone, after game six, talked about how, like, he specifically said Anthony Edwards is unguardable, and so we have no choice but to guard him the way that they've been guarding him, which is double teams on every ISO, traps on every pick and roll. They had to do that. And like that's the thing. Like you have to you have to look at the bigger picture. It, this is why box score watching is so frustrating. It's like, yeah, he, he has a he had a rough shooting night. But down the stretch of this game, and you guys will see on film, Anthony Edwards consistently drawing double teams was a huge factor in his team uh, generating quality shots. In addition to that, he generated a lot of rim pressure in that second half. And that's the thing is like the superstar burden is everything is about slowing you down and you have to find a way somehow to impact winning. And I thought Ant did in a big way. These games tend to be ugly. Like you don't win 98 to 90 playing beautiful basketball. It tends to be ugly and Ant found a way to make plays ugly last night. And again, he's 22 years old. This is he's 22 years old and he's passing major tests in in, in his first extended playoff run. It, 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 I just can't say enough about how impressed I am with Anthony Edwards. I legitimately think he might be my best my my favorite player in the league now. Like I I can't help but root for the guy. I think he's so good for the league. I think he's 
obviously the guy that that has a chance to rescue American basketball from what looked like a pretty a pretty down era in terms of quality American basketball players coming out of our high school and college system. Like I, I, he's just he's just the, the league needs him, and and I just I continue to be incredibly impressed by him on the Denver front. If I had to kind of a, a tr- you don't want to overthink it, right? Because you're up by 20 in the second half with a chance to go to the Western Conference Finals. So, like, I don't like the idea of of pretending like the the Nuggets need to make some sort of massive tweak. In addition, I think they probably beat everyone else in the league this year. I would have picked them over Boston. I would have picked them over Dallas. I would have picked them over anybody else in the league except for uh, I picked him over Minnesota and I ended up being wrong. But Minnesota proved the ability to beat Denver. I'm not sure any other team could have. So I don't think it's worth like, you know, like I saw a lot of stuff about like trading Michael Porter Jr. and all these like really aggressive type of moves. I would keep the core five. I don't think that's the issue. I think that there were two flaws that kind of reared their ugly head in this postseason run. First of all, in their starting lineup, if there's one weakness it's the fact that they don't generate a ton of dribble penetration. In order to generate rim pressure, which by the way, rim pressure is like a prerequisite to winning the NBA title. You need to find a way to pressure the rim somehow. And Denver does it through interior size and interior passing. What that means is, is like it's Jokic bullying his way to the basket and then bringing a second defender over and making plays out of it. It's Aaron Gordon cleaning up stuff on the back line. It's even in ball screens, it's Jokic catching on the short roll with his little floaters and pop shots and and attacking off of the catch there, right? Like they are an interior scoring team that is fueled by size and passing ability on their front line, right? That is a different type of rim pressure than beating people off the dribble in straight line drive situations. And one of the issues was Minnesota's front line was so damn big with Nas Reed, Carl Anthony Towns, and uh, and Rudy Gobert, that they were able to mitigate a lot of Denver's bully ball. And so when they were able to kind of mitigate that, it shined a light on the fact that Denver's perimeter players are not guys that can generate dribble penetration. Jamal Murray kind of needs a screen, right? To get uh, He can hit over the top shots, but he needs a screen to get into the paint, right? Like KCP... You know, at this phase of his career, not not like this crazy athletic slasher that uh, that he used to be, and obviously he doesn't dribble the ball well enough to kind of initiate offense that way. I think KCP brings some rim pressure, but it's just a different kind, right? Like Aaron Gordon, same kind of thing. Like he can attack with an advantage, but there's not a lot of like he can break you down off the dribble and and make a a, a ton of stuff happen against an elite defense. And and Michael Porter Jr. is obviously a catch and shoot threat, so like. I think that's the one big kind of like weakness that Minnesota exposed is if you can match up with their size, they can't dribble past you, right? That was kind of the the one big thing. The second piece is I do th- I do think fatigue played a big role. You guys are going to see on the film, and, and there's no excuse because everyone's fatigued, everyone's tired, and in a close game late, you just got to find a way. You got to dig deep, and you got to find a way. And Denver did not in this game, but fatigue played a role, and that's where their lack of depth came to the, fr- the to the forefront. They had the same lack of depth last year, and they conquered it. They had the same lack of dribble penetration last year, although Bruce Brown, I thought, brought a good amount of that, you know, kind of downhill force last year. And, you know, not having Bruce Brown this year certainly ended up playing a role at the end of the day. Um, But the lack of depth ended up showing up this year in fatigue at the end of games. And so... They probably do need to try to add some depth and a little more firepower, is it, it, specifically with athleticism this summer. They probably need to have an option that they can go to, like a sixth starter kind of thing, where against matchups where they need to get more downhill force, they can put somebody in for a KCP or in for a Michael Porter Jr. that brings that downhill force. And I, I, like again, that's going to be the tricky piece this summer, bringing in some depth, bringing in some athleticism, just to bolster... Your uh, uh, your options when you get into these types of environments, but don't overthink it. Again, you were twenty points up with a shot to go to the Western Conference Finals, and I do think Denver, like Denver, is still, in my opinion, every bit as good as the teams at the top of the league. They just caught a bad matchup, and they caught a young star on the rise, and they ended up uh, ended up losing. But again, the rest of the league is going to be improving. Oklahoma City is only going to get better. Memphis, like think about Memphis next year. 
not only do you have John Morant coming back, you've got Desmond Bain, who keeps improving. He's an awesome backcourt partner for John Morant. Gigi Jackson, this like forward that they found that that can shoot the hell out of the basketball, big, strong, can defend. And then you've got Brandon Clark and Jaron Jackson. Like they they are going to be a problem next year too. Anthony Edwards, like he's 22 years old. Like imagine how good that kid's going to be when he's 24, 25. So like. Like again, Denver needs to do a little bit more than they did last offseason to try to bolster and improve their margin for error, which ended up being too small this season. On the Jokic front, again, this is something that this this particular topic is something that matters a lot to me as a basketball fan, but also one that I get really frustrated about when I look out at like kind of the way that most NBA fans behave. For instance, like LeBron fans today are like going out behaving like they won a fifth championship with the way they've been talking about Jokic and the Nuggets. And like, I, I hate that. It's all narrative based. It's all foolish. To me, I'm a big believer in like two different lists. There's the who's the best player in the world in a vacuum kind of list, like a ranking of players based like purely in a vacuum. Like if we were starting a season tomorrow and everyone was in like a draft and you had the first pick, who would you pick for one season to lead your team? There's like that ranking. And then there's like the bragging rights ranking. And this is this is like the list that I go through every summer where it's more of just like a, how do we recognize the players based on their achievements in the last year? Perfect example, that is Luka Doncic. I think, I thought go, coming into the season, Luka was a top four player, but I ranked him at 10th because he missed the playoffs and played like shit down the stretch of the season. So it was like, in terms of in a vacuum, he's in the top five, right? But in this other list where it's like based on bragging rights and accomplishments, like he's considerably lower, right? So there are these two different ways of looking at it, right? So how do we, how do we, you know, kind of digest what just happened with Nikola Jokic within the realm of that list? Because coming into the season, Jokic was a clear number one on both. He was the clear in a vacuum guy and he was the clear bragging rights guy, right? But he just lost in the second round. And not only that, Anthony Edwards kind of played him to a draw in that series. Like if you look back at the numbers, Anthony Edwards, 28 points, five rebounds, six assists, 50% from the field, 37% from three, 85% from the line. He had some bad defensive moments, but he also had some really good defensive moments, particularly at the end of the series. Jokic, 29 points, 11 rebounds, 8 assists, 52% from the field, 23% from three, 89% from the line. And he had some good and bad defensive stretches as well, right? Like he was really good defensively in the middle of the series, really bad on the outside portions of the series. So like Ant and Nikola Jokic kind of played each other to a draw. You were the favorite with home court advantage and you lost. So we got to find a way how to, to digest that, right? I see... You know, I came into the season thinking that Jokic was substantially better than everybody. I've seen two ma major areas of slippage with Jokic, though. First is defense. Last year in the postseason, Jokic played the best defense of his career. He was locked in every single night. He had some tr trouble with some specific matchups, like the team that had the highest off offensive rating against Denver was the Lakers. I think it was, it was like a 116, if I remember correctly. And a big part of that was the LeBron and AD problem and the way that their downhill force combined with interior passing. It's kind of like a, uh, it's like a combination of, of, of what Denver does offensively and what Minnesota does offensively, right? And they cause a, a lot of problems for Denver in their back line defensively. But for the most part, Jokic was awesome in that postseason run. Denver's defense was awesome, and they weren't threatened throughout. This year, outside of games three, four, and five against Minnesota, Jokic was bad. He was bad defensively against the Lakers, and he was bad defensively for the most part against Minnesota. And so that's an, that's an area of slippage. And again, like when you're talking about Jokic ranked with the other players in the league, that's him coming down a level and coming closer to the pack. The second piece of it, the jump shooting. I talked about this all season, and I kept shining a big flashlight on it. I was like, Jokic is awesome, but this is weird. Let's keep an eye on this. Well... Last year in the regular season, Jokic got 1.17 points per jump shot. Last year in the playoffs, he got 1.21 points per jump shot. He shot awesome all year long, day one of training camp, through to when he hoisted the trophy. That was a huge part of what made Jokic so dominant. This year, he was down about 16% from the previous season. He got 1.01 points per jump shot in the regular season, in the playoffs, 0.87 points per jump shot. 
a big thing that I noticed in this series in particular, there's a reason why he took 10 threes last night. Carl Anthony Towns was showing quickly on Jamal, but always quickly recovering back to Jokic on his rolls. So Jokic, when he would roll into the lane, was constantly getting swarmed. So one of the ways Jokic countered that was by popping. Because when he popped, Cat couldn't get back out to him that fast. And so he found some openings at the top of the key. But then he couldn't make them. And you guys are going to see on the film, I'll show you some examples of Cat like running back to the roll and Jokic kind of popping free at the top of the key. Like he took those threes because that was what the coverage was allowing. And he just simply could not make them. He made two of them late in the game, but he was two for 10 overall in the game. And for the playoffs, what did I say earlier? 23%. Like that was a major issue. So I still think in a vacuum that Jokic is the best player in the world. And if I do two lists this summer and we have a vacuum list and a bragging rights list, I'm probably going to have Jokic number one in that vacuum list in the sense that if I was starting a season tomorrow, I would draft him number one if, 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 like to, to run a, my team for an entire season for one season, right? But he has slipped as a defender and as a jump shooter, and it has brought him closer to the pack. And as far as the bragging rights go, you lost in the second round with home court advantage with a 20 point lead in game seven. Like you, he lost bragging rights for a year. Now we'll see because I think some, like, I don't think you just give it uh, to anybody. I think someone has to earn it. But there are some guys that have some, that have a chance in the next month to snatch those bragging rights. I think Tatum has a case. I think Anthony Edwards has a case. And I think Luka Doncic has a case. And again, I wouldn't. I, I per, you guys know how I feel about Tatum. I really like him as a player, but I don't think he. I don't think I'd ever take him number one in a vacuum. But if he dominates everybody and hoists the trophy, he gets bragging rights for the next year. Same goes for Ant. Same goes for Luca. So again, is I, the way I look at it, he did vacate the top spot on the bragging rights list, but he still has the top spot in a vacuum. However, his lead in a vacuum is shrinking, and it's shrinking because he is slipping in a couple of key major areas. His defense and his jump shooting. All right, guys, on that note, let's take a look at some film. I've got a lot of stuff to show you guys. I kind of just started at the beginning of the run and just kind of worked through how exactly Minnesota did what they did last night. So this is going to be 39 clips of me just kind of going into detail for how Minnesota did what they did last night. We're this close to crowning a new NBA champ. And with the action heating up on the court, it's even hotter at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. There's only so many games left. And DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered with same game parlays, live betting, odds boosts, and so much more. Don't miss out or you'll have to wait until next NBA season to place your bets. It's super easy for first timers to get started. Try betting on something simple like picking a team to win. Go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app, select your squad, and place your first bet. It's that simple. The championship odds right now, as we head into the conference finals, according to DraftKings, Boston's at minus 150, the Timberwolves at plus 275, the Mavericks at plus 500, and the Indiana Pacers, a long shot, at plus 2,500. New to DraftKings? Listen up. New customers can get a no-sweat bet up to 1500 bucks. Just deposit at least 5 bucks and you'll get a bonus bet back equal to your first bet if it doesn't hit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code HOOPS. That's H-O-O-P-S. That's code HOOPS for new customers to get a no-sweat bet up to $1,500 if your first bet doesn't hit. Only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. So this was an example of one of the ways that Ant started to kind of get going in the second half. And a big part of it was splitting the high drop. So again, look at the ball screen coming from Gobert on this left side. Jokic is in his high drop, right? There's a gap right there. And Ant is going to shoot through that gap with a crossover dribble. Shoots into the gap, draws Michael Porter Jr. and help on the low man uh, as the low man. And then Jaden McDaniels ends up getting this corner three-point shot. Again, continuing to trust his teammates when he didn't have it going. All right, here's another Carl uh, Anthony Towns play. Let's fast forward here. I think this was the first drive of Cat on Jokic. So again, Cat uh, Cat just looks Jokic in the face, pump fake, rip through to the right. Jokic actually beats him to the spot at first, but in this leverage battle, this is now officially a physical battle, and Cat is now going to win by turning the corner on Jokic and getting into the lane 
and drawing the foul on, on Aaron Gordon. There were a lot of those leverage battles that Cat won with Jokic last night. Again, fatigue plays a role, but Jokic wasn't holding up. Here's an example of Anthony Edwards' defense on Jamal Murray. Let's get up the floor here. The big thing is ball pressure and then fighting over the top of screens. So just watch how Ant stays attached over the top. Now, when Ant stays attached, one of the big things you'll see, this is what I was talking about earlier. Notice Cat is staying home on Jokic, which we'll get to when we talk about some of these pops. But by virtue of Ant staying attached, it makes it so that Jamal can't take a pull-up jumper. When the pull-up jumper is gone, he only really has one other option, and that's to drive into the lane and try to force something over the top of Gobert. But see how he just shuts that action off? Once again, there's a back cut here, but the pass has to get thrown way out in front because Ant is pretty well attached. And once again, this is effectively the same thing as back pressure. He has now funneled Jamal into Gobert, and Gobert ends up blocking the shot. That's outstanding individual defense for Ant. And then off of the turnover, off of the block from Gobert, so... Uh, Gobert gets the block, and then in the process, we get a, a little advantage situation here. Ant just finding a way to generate rim pressure through running up the floor. Here's an example of one of those missed threes. Let's see here. So uh, Kat basically was uh, lingering too long on the pick, so Jokic got a good look. This one wasn't one of the pick and pops that I'll show you. But again, Jokic got good looks. These are all good looks. He just couldn't make them from three. But that was an issue all season long. Let's see here. Here's another transition push from Anthony Edwards. Just watch the rim pressure. Just watch Ant. Don't mess with the half court. Again, we did, I actually should have talked about this more in the open, but... One of the big things I talked about when I was live tweeting the game is in the first half, Minnesota was playing with nowhere near enough pace. They kept walking the ball up the floor and attacking Denver's set defense. Much better job by Ant and everybody in a Timberwolves jersey in the second half of every time they got a stop and a rebound, even on made baskets, just bringing the ball up quickly and trying to find something while the defense was not set. Again, look at Ant. Just in transition, finds a little gap, draws three bodies, kick out pass to Jaden McDaniels. By the way, those are two massive corner threes from Jaden McDaniels. He, I, this offensive support that they got last night was all critical. This is a really, really bad... Uh, um, so, double team from Jaden McDaniels. Look at this miss from Porter Jr. <laughs> Just it like literally hits the side of the backboard. In transition, though, uh, this is another example of Ant. Again, notice notice how on offense we're seeing a lot of quality shots that Ant is generating. Here's another one. Watch the double. Double team, kick back to Cat. I think it actually gets worked back to Ant. Yeah, so he's working on Gordon here. Here comes the double. You guys can see this play develop, right? Everyone's matched up. Mike Conley's here in the corner. He's going to hit a three. So you guys can probably guess what's going to happen. Double team, extra pass, extra pass, extra pass. Watch. Rotate. No attempt to rotate from Jokic. So again, like that doesn't show up in the box score for Ant. He doesn't get an assist for that, but that's a wide open three that Mike Conley got because he's been so dominant for the entire damn series that Mike Malone thinks he's unguardable. And so he's throwing a second defender at him all night. Like you gotta, you gotta look beyond the box score and look at how these guys are impacting winning. Like I've just shown you three straight threes in a huge run that were all directly generated by Anthony Edwards. Here's another just straight line drive from Cat against Jokic. Just on an island, straight line drive, just beats him to the left and makes a layup. It just, just wasn't the same level of defender that he was last season. This, I think, is the pick and pop three, if I remember correctly. Let's see. So you guys will see, again... So one of the reasons why he's popping here, and I'll show you guys a, another example later on, but 
when Jokic rolls, Cat is staying attached to Jokic when he gets in here. And so popping was basically Jokic's counter to the fact that he wasn't getting any short roll catches. But again, it doesn't matter if he can't make the shot. Let's see. This was a turnover from Jokic where he just wasn't being strong enough with the ball. Like cat's swiping and it might be a foul, but it's like you got to be stronger with the ball. It ends up going the other way for a dunk. Let's see. We're going to go down the other end. This is going to be a Jokic post up. This is one of those fadeaways that uh, Cat forced him into. I like this closeout from Jaden McDaniel. So on the double team, notice we've got a two-on-one on the weak side here with Jaden. But Jaden's not going to recklessly close out on Christian Brown, who's a slow release. He can knock threes down, but he's not a super aggressive shooter. Justin Holiday is an excellent corner three-point shooter. So watch this closeout from Jaden. Jaden basically stunts at Christian Brown, but then recovers to Justin. Right Now the advantage is gone. But we're going to end this. Jokic on an island, no double team, eight seconds on the shot clock. Jokic has to get a bucket here, but uh, Kat does a really nice job flattening out his post up and forcing him into a really tough fadeaway. And again, the jump shot just wasn't there for Jokic. This was uh, a, a good look, a rare good look. You're, you're going to notice in the film, there's not a lot of good looks for Denver down the stretch of this game, but here's one that they ended up missing. That Michael Porter Jr. one from earlier, I thought was a good look too. Double team, Christian Brown cuts. So notice what Anthony Edwards does. As soon as this double team is here and Christian Brown is cutting, Ant has to show on the cutter. Nice skip pass from, from Jokic to, uh, to KCP. He just misses the three. But when the, when the good looks are few and far between, the good looks get harder to make as well. Because no one's in rhythm. Here's some more rim pressure from Cat. This one, I think, is on the post up of Reggie Jackson here on the, the left block. Just notice the spin off. Boom. Ends up getting to the foul line. He His rim pressure was huge in the second half of this game. He's good in the first half, too. I should give him credit for that. All right. Let's see here. We're going to see Jokic actually score on Cat this time. But one of the things I want you to notice, notice all of these Jokic post-ups against Cat turn into right shoulder fades going away from the basket. It's a little bit stronger of a move, but still it's a right shoulder fade. So Cat just did a really nice job of flattening out his post-ups and making him take over the top shots, which he just wasn't making as frequently. Here's another drive from Cat, this time against Christian Brown. Nice rip through to the left, strong with the basketball. Look at that right shoulder there. That's that, like, it's almost, Giannis is really good at this too. We're like, so he gets the angle. Here's the angle, but Christian Brown's going to try to cut him off. Now, right here on the gather, after he's low, watch this right elbow come up and around Christian like that to try to create the leverage. Watch it. Just whip it around to create the leverage. Get the angle to the basket. Really, really nice work from Cat. Now, this was a, another example of Ant doing a number on Jamal Murray, just cleanly strips Jamal in the backcourt or right around half court. He's going to dribble up here. Watch Ant. Just lunge at the basketball, swipe it away. Now we're going the other way for another dunk. This was the foul that got challenged and did not get overturned. I was actually surprised by this call. I thought this was good defense from Cat. So we get Jokic on an island. Cat, same sort of thing. Once again, forces him into a right shoulder fade. Bad call. Jokic ends up getting two foul shots out of it. But that's really good defense from Cat. And notice once again, he forced Jokic into a tough right shoulder fade. All right. And this was that huge shot that Anthony Edwards hit against Aaron Gordon in ISO um, to end the third quarter. Big time shot. Really changed the psychology of the game.
Rudy Gobert, absolutely disastrous first half, and he had a beautiful fourth quarter. Starts with a a, a nice uh, slip on this roll from Mike Conley and hits the uh, little lefty bank shot in the lane for the and one. He had a lot of free throws in the fourth quarter as well. Once again, this is more really, really good defense from Ant on Jamal Murray. Watch the watch the chasing over the top, avoiding the screen and the funneling. And remember, specifically, those of you guys who have been following my film sessions all series, you guys know like one of the things I've been critical of with Ant defensively is he doesn't work hard enough to fight over the top of screens sometimes. But he certainly has the tools to do it. And when he does, he can be frightening chasing over the top of screens. Look at how he stays attached here. It's when they rescreen. So here's the rescreen to watch Ant stay over the top and watch him stay attached. Actually, he does duck under, but there's a rescreen here. Here we go. Here's the one he goes over the top. Okay. But look at how he stays attached. See, doesn't get screened, stays attached. Now he's funneling. Now, again, Jamal, the pull up jumper is not an option because Ant is attached. That forces him to drive into Go Bear. That's that bracket that I always talk about. Now, as a result, we end up getting a late clock grenade thrown back to Jokic. By the time he gets back to Jokic, there's five seconds on the shot clock. What I find fascinating here, too, that little uh, Jokic should have shot right away, but he doesn't trust his shot because he just missed a bunch of these. So he's not confident in it. Then he ends up having to take like this kind of funky one in the late clock situation now that Nasrid is up on him. That was a big-time defensive rebound from Ant on that one, too. Here's that transition cross match uh, after this shot. So watch, again, big-time rebound from Ant. They're running out the other way. Look, everyone's sprinting. Nas Reed, in particular, is sprinting. And as a result, Jamal Murray ends up having to pick him up here in a second. Jokic steps up on Gobert. Now Nas Reed is on Jamal. Just quickly makes a strong move, goes to the lefty hook, knocks it down. That's another example of what I was talking about earlier about pushing with pace. Minnesota was just much better at playing with pace in the second half. More funneling from Ant here. Uh, Jokic ends up scoring on Gobert. So Jokic is going to get a bucket here, but I want you guys just to watch Ant. Watch the job Ant does staying attached to Jamal on this whole possession. There's no advantage. Jokic makes a play, though. To Jokic's credit, like it wasn't all bad. Like he he had a lot of mistakes in the fourth quarter, but he also hit a bunch of big shots to keep his team close as well. But that's obviously what you expect. He just needed to do more. Here's another example of uh, um, advantage creation from Ant. Let's see. You saw the double team got a wide open look for Nas Reed. Now we're going to uh, this is the late clock situation where McDaniels bullies Jamal. So watch, gets downhill, bumps him off, hits that little floater in the lane. That was a big time shot in this game. But you saw you saw at the beginning of that possession too, just another wide open look generated by Ant drawing a double team. So on the previous possession, Michael, Michael Porter Jr. had just tied the game with a three, a pump fake three, and it kind of felt like Denver was regaining some control. And then this is the shot that Conley hits to erase. So it was like one pump fake three to erase another against Jamal Murray. Big time shot for Mike Conley. Here's another Jokic miss from three. Once again, on the ball screen, because Cat has been staying attached to Jokic, Jokic decides to pop instead of roll. But he just can't make them. He does finally hit one on this possession. Kind of fakes a cut, knocks it down. The two threes that he hit here were big time to kind of keep that game close. But again, if he was hitting them at the same rate he was last postseason, maybe this is a win for Denver. Go Bears prayer. Oh, man. I'm sure this was a moment where you were very frustrated if you were a Nuggets fan. Got to get a little lucky if you're going to win the title. You know how that goes. This was a really interesting example of uh, um, a dynamic that played out this entire series, which is the Jokic posting up Cat. 
Gobert in help, but Gobert stunting and taking advantage of Jokic's hesitance to to want to shoot the basketball. So Jokic bullies his way down, and notice the stunt from Gobert that baits him into the pass. This should have been a shot from Jokic, but instead, Gobert kind of stunts at him and immediately recovers, and now he's back in position on Gobert. So there was no real double team. There was no real advantage. Now Gordon's trying to finish over uh, literally you know, one of the top five shot blockers in the league. It's going to be tough. And then Gobert, uh, Gordon immediately turns it over off of the offensive rebound to Jaden McDaniels and then fouls him while he's in the penalty, which sends him to the line. He makes both free throws. So big, uh, you know, kind of an execution error from Jokic and then uh, a couple of uh, decision-making errors from Aaron Gordon. Jokic is going to hit another three here, but watch, watch Anthony Edwards on Jamal. Watch this matchup right here. Stays attached, chase over the top, funnel. There's no advantage. Top lock, this is top locking. He's not allowing Jamal Murray to use the screen in ball denial. Again, watch this from the start. Th like this is why Jamal this is why Anthony Edwards went into the locker room and said I had him in handcuffs. It was this right here. It's this kind of stuff. Just staying attached, taking away all of his easy stuff, top lock, deny, just not letting him get involved. Remember, Zero points from Jamal Murray from the minute Denver was up 20 to the minute Minnesota was up by five. Jokic ends up bailing him out with a prayer from, uh, from the top of the key. This was one of the many examples that I thought demonstrated Jokic's fatigue down the stretch of this game. Watch the Gobert-Jokic matchup on the glass. Another ball screen. High drop. And it's driving right here, though. Shot is up. Jokic is faced up with Gobert. Neither player has an advantageous position. Let's see who gets the ball. Like if Jokic just goes and makes contact and boxes out Gobert, he has the ball there. But instead, he doesn't. Gobert gets the offensive rebound. Michael Porter Jr. fouls him. They're in the penalty. That's two points. That was a like if you factor in you know the loss of the opportunity to push out and transition the other way and the foul. That's a that's a costly mistake from Jokic there. And again, two two more big clutch free throws from Gobert. He was amazing down the stretch of this game. This was one of the other rare good looks. Again, not a lot of good looks for Denver down the stretch of this game, except for the Jokic pick and pop threes, which he wasn't making all series, right? But here's a good look. Look at this screen from... Uh, so this actually starts out of a double team. Jokic passes to Jamal. Jamal passes to KCP. KCP throws it to uh, uh, to Michael Porter. Watch this screen from Gobert. Gobert or, uh, from Gordon, excuse me, on Gobert. He's literally blocking like he's a left tackle. So that, But they get a decent look, but MPJ just could knock down the shots in this series the way that he did against the Lakers. And then I, I really was confused by Jokic's thought process here. So he gets an offensive rebound, but he's completely surrounded, and usually he'll pump fake or something, but he just telegraphs the hell out of this, and then and Nas Reed just easily blocks him. see here's Jamal Murray's first bucket since they were up by 20 and it was a conceded switch from Ant so he gives up the switch Nas Reed ends up on Jamal and he hits a step back jumper over uh and offers a token late contest but that was his first bucket since they were up 20 that's why that's why Anthony Edwards thought he had him in handcuffs this was another really bad example of Jokic being tired I thought and just honestly, here's the thing. I get it. You're tired. I get it. It's 83 to 80 with five minutes left in game seven. Like you have to dig deep and find a way. Uh, this was a, another example of shot creation from Ant. So the ball is going to get swung around. Ant's going to draw a double team, right? So now we have three players in position here. Gordon is double teaming Ant. Ant throws the pass to Nas Reed. Nas is now going to get a wide open opportunity to attack a closeout by virtue of the double team that Ant draws. Watch Jokic's defense here. Nas Reed beats Jamal. W what is this? What is that? That's embarrassing. That's game seven, three-point game, five minutes left. 
You got to get, you have to get a stop. And this is the defense we got. That's really bad guys that like, again, and I understand again, it's hard to be critical of a player when he's played as well as Jokic has over the course of the season. This is the standard when you're the best player in the world. This is the this is what you're held to. Not only the best player in the world, but a player, three-time MVP, one of only nine players in NBA history, a guy who's in a lot of conversations with all-time guys. There's a there's an expectation that comes from that, and and this just isn't good enough. Uh, this was the second bucket that uh, Jamal got in crunch, uh, crunch time here down the stretch. Notice the separation. Ant, Jamal gets a really good running start and actually manages to get some separation from Ant. And as a result, he can get off a decent little floater in the lane that Ant can't back pressure. But he just... that The bottom line is he only really got separated from Ant twice in, these, in this entire stretch. Like, and, and that's why I think Ant feels like he won the battle. Another really good drive and kick possession from Ant here. Again, really good shot quality from uh, from Ant with his rim pressure. Watch Ant here. He's just going to toast Jamal Murray off the dribble, split the double team, get into the lane, draw multiple defenders, clean look for Nas Reed. Again, the, the Timberwolves were just getting better shots. Once again, look at this rebounding battle. Gobert beats him again. Just, just again, I know fatigue was a role, but just too many mistakes from Jokic down the stretch of this game. And then off of this offensive rebound from Gobert, they get another opportunity, right? This is what happens on the next opportunity. Ant draws the double team. Actually, rejects the screen and goes downhill. This is the part that I thought was interesting. So, I clipped this uh, this play and put it on my Twitter feed earlier. Watch Jokic and watch MPJ. We're going to watch the play twice. Let's watch Jokic to start. So, Ant's downhill, but he's going against a rim protector, right? So, he might miss this layup. Gobert runs downhill to try to get the ball. Jokic leaks out. No attempt to clean up the defensive glass. That's That's bizarre. Like he just, everyone is crashing. Everyone in a white jersey is crashing to the rim. Look at all these white jerseys crashing. And Jokic is leaking out. Now, watch it from Nas Reed and Michael Porter Jr.'s perspective. So, MPJ's there. Nas Reed in the corner. Watch Nas Reed on Michael Porter Jr. He's going to crash. Get off of me. Then he's going to get the offensive rebound and he's going to draw the foul on KCP. Like, it, like, again, when I talk about Minnesota shaking Denver's foundation, that's what I mean. That's not the Denver Nuggets that we know and recognize. Denver Nuggets have been an elite defensive rebounding team forever. That's not the Jokic that I recognize. They made Denver look like a completely different team. And, and that is a testament to the ability of Minnesota's defense to really rattle an opponent. All right, let's see. Only have a few more guys. We're getting to the end. Three more, actually. Here we go. More Anthony Edwards defense on Jamal Murray. Watch this. This is incredible defense. Attached. Recover. Fight over the screen. Funnel. Swipe down at the basketball. Like Jamal, Jamal was in handcuffs. He was just in. He was in handcuffs. Now we're going to get Nas Reed on Jokic. Blocks him for the second time in the fourth quarter. That's that's unbelievable defense from Minnesota. Here's Nas Reed again on the offensive glass. Watch Nas Reed here. Ant draws the double team. Swing, swing. Look, we got our Gobert here, Jamal, Jokic. Watch Nas Reed just out hustle all of them. It was, it was like, again, it, fatigue was obviously a factor, 
But Minnesota did that to them. Minnesota rattled Denver to their core. And then this was our dagger. Ants ball pressure. Mike Conley comes in with like a random double team, swipes the ball away from Jamal. Ant runs to the corner and hits the dagger. So yeah, I've uh, I went through all of it earlier in the show, so I'm not going to go through it again. But I think I think that the, that film session kind of gives you guys a breakdown of just like how Minnesota did what they did, and really it was just oppressive defense and rim pressure and transition the other way, the double teams from Anthony Edwards, and all of that rattling Denver's foundation and making them play a very uncharacteristic basketball game. And so tip of the cap to Minnesota. They deserve to go to the conference finals. Denver's got to look in the mirror a little bit and address some things this offseason, especially as it pertains to their depth. I, I I agree with a lot of the optimism that I heard from some specific nuggets after the game. Jamal Murray said, we're back to being the hunter. Love to hear it. You're right. There's human nature is makes it hard to repeat, right? Like it's like Mike Malone said before the season, like it takes talent to win a championship. It takes character to repeat. And Denver failed that test this year, but they do have the talent to go win it next year. They are hungry. Mike Malone referred to the Spurs and talked about how we're not done. And it just because you don't repeat doesn't mean you can't be a dynasty. Love the attitude. Denver will be back. You're you're an idiot if you think Denver's done. Like they're gonna find a way to be back in the mix year after year after year. They're, Jokic didn't win three MVPs. Because because he has just some sort of massive media support. He also is, in a vacuum, the best basketball player in the world, even with the warts that he showed in this season. So I think Denver's going to be back. They got punched in the mouth this year. They got humbled a little bit. They're going to be back next year. They're going to make some noise. I'd be, I think it'd be foolish to write them off. All right, guys, that is all I have for today. I'm going to be right back on in a little bit uh, with a series preview on Celtics Pacers. I will see you guys then.